to get out of my crystal. <laughs> I've never been more nervous during an introduction when I heard that. <laughs> As we all know, there are many people who uh, grace the world of marine mammal studies that we say, oh, please don't think I'm one of those folks. But anyway, thank you for that, uh, that uh, introduction. It turned out very nice. I think. And breathe regularly now. Um, I have a, an unusual situation professionally. The, um, as, as Renato said, I have a chair in business ethics at Loyola Marymount University. I'm director of the Center for Ethics and Business there. Actually, it gets stranger. My, uh, this is my second career as an academic. For the first 20 years, I specialized in 16th century Renaissance humanism. You know, the most natural thing to do before you, particularly when you're going to do work on the mammals. So, um, I like to think I do interesting things. I think some of my colleagues think that I have a personality disorder. Uh, they may be right, but anyway. Um, I came to work on uh, philosophical issues related to marine mammal science almost accidentally. But what I want to talk about tonight is less about the substance of the work that I've done, the substance of the argument of the defense of dolphins and the, and the work I've continued to do. But I want to reflect on more the process and some of the challenges that come from doing interdisciplinary work and some of the challenges that go with scientific progress and the discoveries that have been made over the last 30 to 50 years about cetaceans. And um, so what I want to do is to, is to kind of talk about that and then uh, reflect on some of the challenges about how we may address, we, I mean, you know, all of us, since we're all in the same boat in this way, uh, want to address these things as we go along. Uh, I'll talk about 20, 25 minutes, uh, so you can start your clock so I can run on time. Uh, so that's the way, the way it'll go. Then we can discuss if you want. Um, I've been an academic for 40 years. I got an early start. And the entire time I have been in academics, I have heard interdisciplinary work, multidisciplinary work is a good thing. We have to get out of the boxes of our disciplines. And I've, I've never heard anyone disagree with that. It's kind of intuitively obvious that if we can bring different intellectual disciplinary perspectives to a problem, we will, things will work better. The uh, problem, though, is that that's easier, it's not that it's easier said than done, it's that there are, it, it turned out to be remarkably easy for me to do this, but the, uh, the problem is that getting the results of that kind of inquiry back into the mainstream, I have found to be really pretty daunting. So what I want to do, first of all, is talk about the process of how I got into this. John Hildebrand earlier asked me casually, how do you, uh, you get into this? And I said, well, I'll talk about that tonight. And so thank you, John, for waiting. Um, this, is, this, is, this is the answer. So I want to talk about how I got into this, what the process was, and then what I see as some of the, as I said, some of the challenges about, about all of this. Now, I want to say at the outset, for anyone who is a student, anyone who is a junior faculty, uh, in essence, this is the don't do this at home morning. Uh, and I'm serious about this. And this is, uh, this kind of non-traditional research uh, is, a, uh, is a risky business to be in. I mean, my, I've had significant problems in my career, not problems, but issues in my career because of that. And one of the things I want to, I want to at some point I want us all to talk about is the fact that there are some ways in which this kind of work, which we always say is a good thing to do, <coughs> if you do it too early in your career, you, it really is a matter of professional suicide. So, how did I, how did I end up being here, a philosopher talking to, to you all? Well, as I mentioned to John, it was virtually by accident. Uh, I had been a, uh, at the time, I was teaching at a small uh, liberal arts college in New Jersey, Uppsala College, which sadly no longer exists. And I was teaching in the philosophy and religion department, and I was teaching regular philosophy courses. The, uh, I had written a short ethics textbook for my students because I wasn't happy with what was available. 
and the print was all published. And they then contacted me because I have a fairly casual, readable style. And they said, we'd like you to do, a, you know, would, would you be willing to do an introductory textbook for us? But what we'd like is that you end up talking about the philosophical issues by going through some non-philosophical disciplines. So I said, sure. You know, what did I know? I was young and uh, stupid. So uh, at the time, it, you know, to, do, to do that wasn't, for most of it, wasn't a big problem. I knew enough about psychology to be able to talk about you know, sort of psychological issues to then get to sort of free will and determinism. Uh, I knew enough about theoretical physics to get to some issues about the nature of reality and all of that. But I really needed a chapter or two on science. Now, there is some supreme irony that I end up talking to scientists because I was this much of a science guy in college. We had a one-year general biology requirement. And I took, oh, one year science requirement. I took the general bio course because it was the only course that did not have a lab. So that was my scientific background. Now, I admired scientists. I thought it was, they did wonderful work, but I wasn't one of those folk. So I had this problem. How do I now figure out how to get something from biology, particularly, into the book? I also had another problem at the same time, which was that I had to deal with, in the book, a topic that, uh, in contemporary metaphysics, you know, it's the notion of personhood. What is it to be a being when you have a certain sort and when you remove all uh, definitions regarding species? Now, in the world of contemporary metaphysics, I will tell you quite plainly, the discussions about personhood are as dull as toast. And actually, that's, a, that, that's not entirely accurate, just to put it that way is an insult to toast. <laughs> and I needed to find a way to talk about something like that in a way that the people reading the book and my students wouldn't be asleep after a page and a half. So, you know, I'm trying to figure this out. A couple of things happened. Uh, I, uh, I grew up in, Rock in Massachusetts by the water, and you always hear interesting stories about dolphins when you're by the water. And a friend of mine came back from Florida who had been on one of these dolphin swim programs. And I thought, okay, this could work. I can, you know, sort of ask the fictional question, are dolphins persons? And I'll get this, you know, I'll do this two chapter set, one, you know, this analysis of concept of personhood, and then I'll, you know, I'll spend some time reading about the science. I'll go down, you know, in a dolphin swim program, and, and that'll be it. So I thought, okay, problem solved. This is a kind of one time thing. Well, I went down to the Dolphin Research Center, where I started talking to trainers, met uh, a woman who's now Laura Engelby, whom some of you know, who was with Noah in, uh, in Florida. And uh, Laura was just a tremendous resource, because of that, this was now, the, this was now 1988 when I got into all of this. And that summer, I was uh, going to be at Berkeley for a postdoctoral seminar on Socrates, and Laura said, oh, you have to meet Ken Norris, Diana Reese, Baron Twardsey. They're all terrific people. And so she gave me their names and addresses and sent them. So I go off to, to California. And, and I meet with all of those folks. And I've got to tell you, initially, I had great apprehension about whether any, any credible scientist would be willing to talk to me on all of this. And I've got to tell you, you can't, anyone who Ken Norris, just, you know, a god among men, couldn't have been more generous, couldn't have been more helpful. Diana, Baron, everybody that I talked to just was super. Now, as I said, I figured this was kind of a one-time chapter. I get to California, this is the late 80s, the dolphin tuna controversy, we know nothing about on the East Coast. So I, I get out here, I hear about that as well. And so as I'm finishing up this, you know, some prolific chapter that I was doing for the book, which really had no answer to it. I kind of look at the, the research and don't come to any particular conclusions. And, uh, but now that I'm about to go in a year or so, I end up in business school, I thought, okay, I can. Uh, since I need to shift my research from the 16th century, I'll write about some of the ethical issues connected with the dolphin fishing, dolphin tuna crop. And so at that point, I started going to the ACS meeting, the Marine Mammal Conference, and in one of those, I met Denise Herzen. Uh, 
and I'm uh, these days I'm a member of her, the you know, her advisory board uh, on the Wild Dolphin Project. And again, Mara said you got to meet this woman who's doing this study on wild wild dolphins in the Bahamas. So I talked to Denise, another incredibly generous person, who said you got to come out to uh, to see this. So I uh, and I'm thinking this is the most natural thing in the world for a philosopher to do. You know, to read all the scientific literature I'm told to read and then to go along on field work. Turns out, philosophers don't do this sort of thing. So I go out in 1990 with me, I'm hooked. And up until a few years ago, every field season, I'd be out uh, observing you know, her work. I assume if, if you don't know about the Wild Dolphin Project, for decades now, Denise has been doing uh, studies of wild, a couple of communities of wild uh, spotted dolphins. Just you know, amazing work. And so, uh, I like to think I have the distinction of being the only philosopher on the planet doing this kind of work who's actually spending a significant time observing field work. Uh, now, I do know that my role on the boat was something between ballast and shark bait, but nonetheless, I was, I was really honored to be there. So, you know, this goes really well. I do, you know, I do all this research for a number of years. I wait, it took me about 15 years before I felt comfortable to write the book because I'm coming from a place of of knowing nothing, and especially once you get into the world of, of wild dolphins, things become dramatically more complicated and dramatically more, more interesting. So, finished the book, uh, probably in about 2004, I guess it was. And then, now I should say in the meantime, I'm doing papers on, the to on these topics at some philosophy conferences. And after I do this three or four times, I decide, this is pointless. Nobody is really interested in the multidisciplinary dimension of all of this. And the science, the questions that they ask show so little understanding of the scientific literature. I'm bored. So I actually kind of disappeared from my own field for a few years because the mechanism that we typically use for helping you engage in problems wasn't working. And, and I'm not a scientist, so it didn't really make any point for me to, to, to talk to you know, scientific uh, um, Symposia, although I had good conversations with people like Ken and the East and, and scientists who were interested in all of this. When I get to try to publish the book, I have, of course, you know, now a folder of rejections that say, and it's not really a philosophy book. It's not really a science book. It takes me a couple of years before I finally get a contract with Blackwell, uh, who they put it in a, a, um, a series in philosophy and public policy. By, but the manuscript is originally like 140,000 words, and they say, well, that's really nice, except you know, we don't want anything more than 80,000. So I you know, cut, the, cut a lot out of that book. And I'm thinking, okay, this is now the point where I'll be able to get people engaging in the issues, because what the book does is survey, for most of the book, is actually a survey of the scientific research that's been done on the intellectual, and emotional abilities of dolphins, really in the last 50 years. So what's that? You know, brain structure, uh, standard research, uh, and everybody, you know, Lauren Marino, uh, Adam Pack from the Berman's lab, uh, everyone that I talked to has been incredibly generous about letting me you know, talk about their research. And so I'm figuring what I'm trying to do is just lay out the scientific research that explains uh, what kind of beings dolphins seem to be when you look at this data from the point of view of a philosopher. And so the answer to me then came to me now that I was more deeply into everything, it looked to me like dolphins were non-human persons. That is, they were beings who had the kind of, in particular, individuality that we seem to have. And then the second question, what does that say? What are the ethical implications of that? Well, when you then look at issues related to human-dolphin interaction, it then meant that there were a number of issues that needed deeper exploration about uh, in the fishing industry, you know, deaths and injuries of dolphins, uh, captivity, captive breeding, and the like in the entertainment business. But you know, at the very least, there were some issues that the science had now brought to the surface that hadn't been there before. Legitimate issues that all the scientists I've heard of said, yeah, these are, these are, this, is all, this is all okay. Well, in a way, this was now a marker. It should have been a marketer's dream. I published the book just as the UN's Year of the Dolphin is being announced. Uh, I'm invited to speak at the New England Aquarium, the Aquarium of the Pacific down you know, in Long Beach. Uh, 
I'm scheduled to do a presentation at, at an analyze conference in Oxford, and then get another gig speaking in another place in the UK, and I speak at, at the UN Environmental Program headquarters in Bonn, Connecticut, because they're having the Year of the Dolphin, which then leads up to ask me to be the US ambassador to the Year of the Dolphin program. All of which would sound to be, oh, this book is just going to take off. Well, the book came out in 2007, and I can tell you that most of you probably haven't heard of it. Uh, and most of you probably haven't heard of me. And the book has sold still fewer than 2,000 copies, which means not even the library, all the libraries bought it. But the issue is not, you know, book sales. The issue is what this, what has, this has taught me about trying to communicate back into a mainstream when you do kind of non-traditional work. Because by every mechanism or every, every measure that you take, the discussion about the book that I was able to, to get going should have gone somewhere, but it didn't. And this is, as I said, part of the, the main, one of the main things I'm talking about is the challenges that come from doing multidisciplinary, non-traditional research when the intellectual infrastructure that we have built is really, you know, inter is really disciplinary. And, and which is one of the reasons I'm thrilled to be here, because this is, this is in fact only the, let's see, the fourth, in, in, in the 20 years or so I've been doing this, only the fourth time I've had, you know, the attention of a group of scientists. In the early 90s, I was living in New Jersey, and I, mean, I was living in Princeton, actually, and I got asked to speak about my work to a group of scientists, although they were mainly physicists and not biologists. Uh, a couple of days, yes, few weeks ago, I did a poster. Uh, earlier this year, this is one of the, the, the few exceptions to uh, the fact that, that most of what I've been doing has been largely you know, overlooked. Uh, last year, I uh, did a uh, talk at the uh, AAAS meeting. There was a panel of Diana Reeves, Laurie Marino, and I, and Jerry Shubel, commented, commented on on the um, ethical implications of the scientific research on dolphin intelligence. And so the, uh, the general, um, as I said, that's a real exception. And uh, one, of the, one of the issues that I've been facing, one of the challenges I think that all of us in the world of marine mammal studies face is how do you then get engagement on, on some issues like this? The, um, oh, one of the things that, engagement of these kinds of issues, at least in my experience so far, has relied too, on too much is, you know, sort of individuals who are really making a fuss about something. When I mentioned the, a, the AAAS meeting as, as an exception, where, so let me talk a little bit about that because that, that was very interesting and, and sort of speaks to this in a different way. It's how do we get, not only scientists, but how do we get the general public engaged in the, the important implications of really progressive scientific research? Um, woman at MIT, uh, Stephanie Bird, was a, a specialized in research ethics. I met her a few years ago, and she was very interested in this whole topic and asked if, since she puts panels together for the AAAS occasionally, she asked if, you know, if I'd help her do this. So we lined up uh, Diana and Laurie and Jerry for a panel on all of this. So Stephanie proposed it to the AAAS meeting a couple of years ago in Chicago, and they said flatly no. And things would have died there, except Stephanie was very persistent and savvy, believed this was a good topic, that the scientific community should look at it. She pushed and so she got into the meeting last year in, in San Diego. But it was only because of her persistence that this happened. Now, when it got, when the, the, the abstracts got posted, <coughs> it caught the attention of the science editor of the London Sunday Times, who wrote a big story about what was coming up. And if you, curiously, it's written as, you know, so scientists announced these discoveries, dolphins as not human persons. Well, actually, you know, Diana and Laurie and I are talking about things we've done for like 20 years, so it wasn't exactly a discovery, but caught a lot of attention in the press, largely outside of the U.S. Uh, I was interviewed by, um, or contacted uh, by uh, reporters, journalists from uh, South Africa, 
Hungary, Romania, um, the UK, uh, Canada, Australia, the BBC sent a film team, Australia sent someone, and I think I was interviewed by the, uh, the Pacifica station in San Francisco. And it said something also, I think, about the culture in the US and the lack of responsiveness to what really very significant you know, scientific issues that people like Laurie and Diana, especially in my kind of background, were, were bringing up. And so, mainly what I, what I wanted to bring up tonight was a problem. I don't, I don't know how to crack this one, although clearly the fact that we we're all talking about this and that I got invited is a very positive sign. Uh, but the fact that I've been work, doing this kind of work for 20 years, and I suspect most of you, you know, didn't know that, um, is, I think, a sign of one of the challenges that we all who are firmly committed to interdisciplinary work have to figure out. And I was serious when I said, you know, if you're a student or you're a ju your junior faculty, you don't want to do this thing, this kind of thing, early in your career because it is risky. Uh, and it shouldn't have to. But I, I've gotten very pragmatic about, about this kind of, of thing. <coughs> So I think the bottom line, as I see this, is that um, from my side, I continue to try to get philosophers, that is, appreciating what's involved in interdisciplinary work, I try to get philosophers more appreciative of the fact that the level of sophistication of scientific literature has to go up for anyone who's talking about you know, the rights of non-humans. Uh, and I think philosophers have to get out in the field so please, if a philosopher comes up to you and says, can I go and watch your stuff, you know, please say yes, and I'm sure you will, because the scientists have been terrific on all of this. Um, and, uh, and I think that, that the scientific community, I think, has to be uh, some really, really continue to make an effort. And people like Cal Whitehead, Laurie are very strong on, on this. Make an effort at looking at the ethical implications in particular of the, the discoveries that science continues to now uncover about cetaceans. Um, Bernardo referred to the uh, Declaration of Rights of Cetaceans, which if any of you were at the ACS meeting, uh, you heard Hal talk about. Uh, Hal is eloquent on culture in, in Wales, and I'd certainly encourage you to take a look at that website, which is www.cetaceanrights.org, if you haven't. Uh, because I think this is something that is a real challenge for, for all of us because uh, unlike where the science was 20 or 30 years ago, when you look at uh, what science, what marine science has revealed about what kind of intellectual and emotional abilities cetaceans have, it really does lead to uh, the necessity for a kind of quiet, calm, serious uh, examination of you know, a variety of things, everything from, from deaths and injuries to captivity to captive breeding you know, and, and the like. Now, unfortunately, in America, there's this penchant for drama, and so you know the only time when issues get discussed are you know, like when, when there's a tragedy and it's not, it's not really the kind of forum for quiet consideration. But I think from a scientific standpoint, that's one of the things that we need to find a place for that kind of quiet, serious consideration you know, among you know, scientists, philosophers, ethicists, whomever, to look and see, and man you know, managers of, of, of for-profit <coughs> organizations, um, you know, corporations. Obviously, I come at this from a certain perspective because I teach in a business school, but that also you know, has, to, has to be in the mix. So, in this way, I'm just sort of trying to set a problem that I would like us all to think about because I, uh, I see my work as kind of an object lesson. This isn't that I did it. Anyone who had done what I did would be in the same situation. But I think that I want to talk about this because I think it, it does uh, present us with a problem that you know, we, we really all want to find a way around. Uh, and I want to end with, uh, I already mentioned about the declaration. I, I would encourage people to take a look at that. I want to end with one, uh, something that has nothing to do with anything that I've been saying directly. But um, philosophers, as you know, get really, if you don't, 
you, your, your life has been blessed. Philosophers get really picky about language. I mean, I've never known another group of people who can't be pickier about language than philosophers. Most of the time, it's annoying. In this way, though, I think there's something beneficial to it. I would ask you, and I ask you in the spirit of scientific and linguistic precision, to try not to use the word animal as much as you do when you refer to whales and dolphins and porpoises and other marine mammals. Because in common parlance, I, I can, I'm not giving anyone a hard time to understand how this works in the profession, but in common parlance, of course, you know, there's humans and there's animals. And animals always end up, you know, kind of second tier down. And when, certainly when the public hear you talk about whales and dolphins and it's always the animals this, the animals that. It is reinforcing the fact that the, 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 the notion that you know to be absolutely false, that humans are very conceivably unique uh, over all other beings. And so, for example, you know, if my, uh, uh, and, and, and to be sensitive of the, the message that that conveys, because for example, as I'm driving home, I, and I, I'll call my wife and she says, well, like, how was the day? And I say, well, you know, at midday foraging, I met this really interesting group of animals. There were like, you know, uh, two adult males, uh, an adult female whom I had been sort of primary social engagement with, and then there were two uh, adult males and, a, and a, an adult female that I kind of had secondary interaction with, and we had, you know, normal, you know, some social ritual, informal interaction. Uh, it's a much better way than saying, I had a really interesting time, you know, meeting Lindsay and Mark and Madeline and we exchanged business cards and swap stories. Uh, you have to appreciate the fact that when uh, people who are not as sensitive as you are to the continuity of all things in the world of nature, that when they hear you say animal, it reinforces attitudes you don't want to be reinforcing. So I would ask you on occasion to try that instead of saying animal, say dolphin, or say whale, or say porpoise, and just see what it feels like. And again, I want to thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, for me, this has been a huge treat and a huge honor. And I'd like to thank the Pacific Life uh, Foundation, uh, the company, and all the people who invited me. And thank you very much. interested in, and I'm sorry for not having read your book. And, and no, no, most people have it. If, if you had all read it, I'd you know, have blown one of the lines of the story, which is that most of you don't know. And so that's a thank you for confirming the fact that most people don't know. I would have been disappointed if you said, gee, I don't know what you're talking about. I read the book. So no, ser I'm serious about this. But I, I, I am interested, so in the, uh, you know, you're, I, you're saying semantics are very important. So right. I, I'm very interested in this term, non-human persons. If you could just define that a little bit more, okay. I, that has very specific meaning, obviously. For right. Me, and I'm yeah. not sure I know what that is. Okay. Well, the short version of this, the long version, you have to buy the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you don't even need to buy the book. Go to my website, www.defensivedolphins.com. I've got chapter summaries. Uh, despite the fact that I'm teaching in business school, I'm not. Uh, I'm not really a good entrepreneur. <laughs> so I think I give away all this stuff. Uh, uh, personhood is, as I said, is a, is a concept that philosophers use to try to uh, squeeze out biological prejudices uh, to make investigations sort of less dependent upon species bias. And so there are a variety of definitions. The one I took was what I thought was the most strict, which was a set of criteria that sort of start with being alive, having awareness of, you know, sort of any kind of awareness of the outside of the world, outside world, um, uh, the ability to perceive pain and pleasure, uh, emotional pain and physical, physical pain and pleasure as well. Uh, and as you go up the, up the, up the ladder, <laughs> things get more sophisticated. Uh, the ability to control one's behavior, uh, the ability to recognize other persons, the ability to solve problems with complex information, communicate, to engage in abstract thought, uh, a variety of, of uh, uh, sophisticated cognitive operations. And the, the ability, one of the most important, the ability to be self-aware. 
So uh, I, don't think, I think I'm, I may be leaving one out, but it's that combination of traits that most of us would say separate a who from a what. And historically, humans have always said, we're the only folk on the planet who have that combination of traits. Now, as most of you probably know, there are people who claim, there are scientists who claim that uh, chimps, uh, orangutans, gorillas, elephants have many or all of those traits as well. So I would uh, say that, well, I'm hard, but I would argue that dolphins are not human persons. I suspect that there's a body of evidence that would suggest the same for, for many others. Now, the, uh, I remember when I was talking to, to Susan Shane early on about this, she said, you know, one of the strange things about the way most humans think about the world is the world of nature is that they don't recognize the continuity of these things. So when I, I remember when I was asking her about this, she said that she would be surprised when they're not kind of a continuity of this sort of thing. So uh, now the, the non-human person argument is neither uh, the best nor I think the most accurate argument to go with. It gets more complicated, but I chose that really from a strategic standpoint because in all the talks I've done with the general audience, that's the one that a general audience of skeptics will most likely listen to. So it's got a kind of bias still in there, which I'm not comfortable with, and so actually the next generation of work that I'm doing is kind of trying to move out of that. But that's that's a long short answer for what does it mean to be an online person. Yes. Um, I like I like your your acknowledgement that there's probably a continuum here, mm -hmm. and and there's you, you spoke of a ladder earlier mm -hmm. of traits. Um, I think that most the problem that most uh, cetacean biologists have is that within the continuum of cetaceans, there's a huge variation that goes on there, and um, you know I think that many of us think that. Cognitive abilities of say baleen whales mm -hmm. may not exceed that of a cow, mm -hmm. um, or at least a wild cow. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, some some wild predecessor of the cow before all intelligence was bred out of it. But you know, <laughs> certainly, I think most of us would think that wolves would fall within that mm -hmm. continuum that's all within the cetaceans, and so there are probably other examples as well. You mentioned the great apes and, mm -hmm. and elephants. Um, so, how do you deal with personhood on that continuum? Right, that's a, it's a great question because even, you know, you just talked about dolphins. You've got, what, 32 different species. Uh, while so much of the research on on uh, cognition has been done on bottlenose, uh, I remember Baron Wurzig saying, man, the smartest of the, you know, the dolphins. So I, I'm sure that there are significant differences within that that make that this kind of an approach problematic. This is one of the reasons I, you know, for myself, have some difficulty with it. The perspective that I'm more comfortable with, but that gets trickier, is that it's not ground, the, the, the issue of what counts as ethical <laughs> treatment of another being is ground less in have they crossed the threshold that we set up, which always has some kind of arbitrariness essentially, or potentially built into it. But what are the conditions that are necessary for a being of that nature to engage, kind of, to develop a full sense of flourishing or development or maturation emotionally and physically. Uh, and that then lets you get much more specific about the capacities of each of those different groups you're talking about. And now for that though, the most important thing, at least from a philosophical standpoint, is one very important threshold is self-awareness, because that does allow for the ability not only to experience pain, but to reflect on it in a way, and to develop a sense of individuality, which does seem to be different between uh, us and, for example, the two cats that my wife have, who are just remarkable beings in their own right, but uh, I just don't know while they have personalities, it's not a kind of you know, inner sense thing. But that's where it gets long and cumbersome. Uh, which uh, I don't want to be here, but, but thanks for asking, because that's one of your exact, that's exactly one of the big problems is, and the, which is why I pitched in the book, I pitched it to non-human persons, because it's easier for most people to, that's hard enough for most people to stop, so. Yes, sir. Where do you get the 